Hey, what's up? This is Alex. Today, I want to clear one huge misconception about one question I'm often asked by, you know, my students during private lessons or by, you know, people on my YouTube channel, which goes something like, hey, Alex, I would love to compose music like yours, but do I need to spend, like, do I need to have thousands of orchestral libraries? Do I need to spend thousands of dollars on, you know, gear and orchestral libraries to do that? And the actual answer is that, no, you don't need to have, you know, lots of libraries and you don't need to spend thousands of dollars to write decent orchestral music. You can even do it by only using one library, which is what I did here. To write this track, which is an example of, you know, what I want to say today, I only use Berlin Orchestra Inspire. It's not as impressive as my other tracks because of reasons I'm going to mention later, but here it is. Here is what it sounds like and I only use one library to write it. So this one was a Final Fantasy XIV mock-up, and uh, I've wrote it with Berlin Orchestra Inspire alone, just to see if I can do that, if I can write decent sounding orchestral music by only using one library, and I could. I only use Isotope on, on the master. Now, I wanted to make this video because it's uh, like beginners fall into a huge trap, which is before they start, they ask, you know, composers, they admire, hey, which libraries do you use? And they either buy or they get those libraries by other means. and you know, when they do that, they have like a huge collection of libraries, but they have zero skills because they are beginners. So even with those libraries, their music sounds like crap and they don't understand why. The reason why is, of course, skill. Like when you write music, you like the, the result that you get, like your song, your songs are a result of the multiplication between your level of skill and technique and etc. and the quality of your libraries, which means if your skill is zero, doesn't matter if you have the whole Edio catalog and all the libraries. If you have all of those and your skills is zero, you're still going to get zero as a result when you compose music. And that's not good. On the other hand, if you're super skilled and you only use cheap libraries you, go for, you got for free because you don't want to invest in your libraries and the quality of the libraries is then zero, that means that your skill multiplied with those libraries is still going to result zero. What do I mean by that? You need both. You need skills and you need good libraries. Of course, if you have average skills and you have great libraries, that's going to help because you get a you know, higher number with that multiplication. And, you know, better libraries always have. They, they help you making things sound better on the go and stuff like that without having to tweak them. But, you know, only limiting yourself to only one library is good because, for example, say I have Berlin Orchestra Inspired, you know, and say I have this part here. And I want the strings to sound better. You know, I'm not pleased with how the strings sound. One thing that people tend to do when this problem occurs, you know, a problem like this is, yeah, let's find a better string library. And if they have made the mistake of pirating the library, which is a mistake, believe me, and maybe I'm going to make another, another video about that. But if they made the mistake of pirating all the libraries, they have a huge list of libraries they can choose. So if they have the strings and they don't sound good, they're just going to pick another library. You know, they just change and that, that's it because they can do that. Or people maybe spend the money and they buy lots of libraries so they can change and it doesn't, like they don't need to apply production techniques to make the strings better. But say you're a wise person and you think, all right, I bought this, I put my savings into this, so I'm going to learn how to use it to the best of its potential. So you find that the strings are, don't have enough bite as much as you want to. What to do? You go on Google, YouTube, whatever, and you search how to, you know, 
make strings more aggressive, how to you know, get more bytes into the strings. And you find tutorials like the ones on my channel, or you find courses, or you find articles, and you might discover maybe tricks like, hey, you can use OTT, which is a free compressor, and you put it on your strings and uh, with these parameters, and you're gonna increase the byte. You try it, and this is what they sound like. Way more byte than this. Suddenly, you have your bite, and you try it. And say, for example, you're pleased with the result. Now you will have discovered about OTT and compression. And you now discovered a new technique, which is increasing your production skills, which means you can you know, extend the level of this library further thanks to your knowledge. And you will now be able to solve this problem in other, like, you know, if, 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 if it presents itself again in other, you know, circumstances, you're going to know, hey, I can use compression. So instead of taking the shortcut to change library, you learn something new for free on YouTube, you know? So you're invested on your skills in instead of investing in your libraries. Now you might ask yourself, all right, Alex, this is all nice and well, but why the hell do you have multiple orchestral libraries then? The reason why I buy multiple libraries is this. So say, for example, we have this part where you have the strings. So the string, ba -ba 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 -ba. that's the main melody that are playing, right? But it kind of blends in with the rest because in building orchestra inspire, what you have is, you know, the full orchestra as, you know, uh, as an instrument. So you have strings, brass, woodwinds, and percussion, and piano, and harp. This is the type of library I recommend you to, to get. And I mentioned this in the video, the best type of library to get as a beginner. But, you know, if you want to, write, if you want to get started with orchestral music, ideally, you might want to get a library that has all the main orchestral instruments into it so you don't need anything else. And uh, that's why I recommend Berlin Orchestra Inspired. There's also Albion 1. There is Metropolis Arc 1. There are many libraries like this one. But Berlin Orchestra Inspired is the one I picked for this example. Now, the issue with this library, say I only had this one. I only had Berlin Orchestra Inspired. Um, the problem with it is that it has limitation, and the biggest limitation of it is that it's only based in ensembles which are pre-prepared and stuff like that. I don't have, like, for example, you know, a patch for you know first violins and a patch for second violins and a patch for cellos and one for basses. I have high strings, low strings, violins one and two, you know, stuff like that, and ensembles. So I cannot split the instrument independently from each other, and. This is one of the limitations of Berlin Orchestra Inspire, which means that all of my strings are going to be ensembles. So in here, we have that melody. In the original track, which is from the composer of Final Fantasy XIV, that melody really stands out in this part because it's played by solo cellos and solo violins, which have a way different sound from ensembles. So if I want this track, like this melody, to stand out, it makes sense to use those, you know, soloist instruments instead of ensembles. Because if I only use ensembles, I am also using, that, using them for harmonies and stuff like that. And even if I double that melody, which I did, I doubled that melody on different octaves, it's still played on ensembles, which have the same type of sound, so it blends in with the rest. And it doesn't really stand out. That's why the original composers used solo cellos and solo violins. And Berlin Orchestra Inspire doesn't have solo cellos and solo violins. And no matter what tutorial I'm going to search online, I'm never going to find a way to take an ensemble, a virtual ensemble, and convert it into something that sounds like a solo violin or solo cello. You cannot do that. So then it makes sense to go on Google and search best solo cello library for this price. And I maybe find Tina Guo solo cello from Cine Samples, then I go there and I buy it because I know that library is going to break one boundary that right now I cannot cross with you know, any types of music production knowledge or any lab, you know, with the library I have. So that's when I buy new libraries. When what I currently own is either slowing me down a lot or when it simply cannot do what I want to do. So in this case, Berlin Orchestra Inspire it cannot give me a solo cello sound. So I buy a solo cello library. That's why I have Tinago solo cello. Or maybe I, you know, this whole song, maybe I want the, I don't know, the, the brass to be more powerful here. <laughs> I can, I can just do that by adding OTT, but the thing is that when you, you know, tweak sounds like this, you add compression, you add aggressive EQ to brighten the sound up and stuff like that, you cannot twist the nature of the sound. And while sometimes, while sometimes that might, be, might provide a good result, 
other times you might want something that sounds more naturally more powerful, you know? So in this case, having Metropolis Arc 1 on the brass would be amazing because that library in the way it was recorded, natu recorded naturally is way more powerful than anything else I tried. So, you know, that's also the reason why it's Metropolis Arc. But for example, Metropolis Arc is great for epic and loud stuff and lots, it has like lots of articulations for that kind of stuff and the natural sound of it is amazing. But I also use Cinematic Strings 2 along with it. Why? Because Metropolis Arc 1 uh, is recorded in such a way that it cannot, like it cannot go quiet. So if I want to write dynamic passages, very, you know, calm and dynamic strings, I cannot do that with Metropolis Arc. And I tried, it doesn't sound good because it's always powerful. So it makes sense for me to go, it made sense for me to go on Google and search for, you know, good strings library. And I found Cinematic Strings 2, the week before Cinematic Studio Strings was released. That's my bad luck. But I bought Cinematic Strings 2. And those, that string library, first, it has, you know, split patches. Like Metropolis Arc 1 doesn't. It has low and high strings too. Cinematic Studio 2 has, you know, violins and cellos and basses and all, you know, split. So I can now write for split strings and it has that dynamic, those dynamics that make it possible for me to write quiet and dynamic passages. So I use it along with Metropolis Arc 1 because I needed something for those dynamic passages. But when it comes to powerful strings, I still use Metropolis Arc. So I use Metropolis Arc for spiccatos and staccatos and stuff like that and marcatos. And Cinematic Strings 2, I use it for what Metropolis Arc is not good at, which is like dynamic passages. On the other hand, Cinematic Strings 2 is not good at, you know, powerful staccato. So in that case, I use Metropolis Arc. So they're like, you know, each library is taking um, like care of something that the other library cannot. So when is a good time to buy a new library? When you feel like you've hit uh, a roadblock and your current libraries cannot you know, uh, give you the result you're looking for, even if you study more music production. That's a good time to buy a new library. Or simply when you want to, I don't know, try something new. If you want to, you, like you use your libraries for months and you're getting stifled by using the same sounds, it makes sense to get a new one. But you don't have to do the thing where you go and you buy a list of insane libraries and you think, yeah, I have the whole Adio catalog now, so I'm going to become the next Hans Zimmer because I have the tools. No. You know, Hans Zimmer has lots of knowledge. He has lots of libraries too, but he has lots of knowledge and you need both. So that's what I wanted to say with this video. And I made this video because first I want to release a video a week now and I didn't have anything else to talk about this week. So that's why I, I made this one. But especially because I see this mistake so many times over in beginners and they don't understand the reason why. They don't understand that investing in skills is important. So I really, really like advise you to just go and instead of, of thinking, hey, uh, how can I get more orchestral libraries? Because that's a question I see on my YouTube channel. Oh, you have lots of orchestral libraries. How did you get them? And that's like, I got these orchestral libraries in like five years, you know, it was spread throughout five years and every single one was a purchase with an intention behind it. It wasn't like, hey, this guy has this library, so I need to have it too. No, this guy has knowledge. That's what you need to acquire, the knowledge. How the hell do you acquire the knowledge of that guy? You search for courses, like the ones I mention every time on this channel, or you search for your tutorials, like the ones I dedicated this whole channel about, and you discover new things, new ways of doing things. And now you have a bit of the knowledge that that guy has, so when you will find yourself composing again, you will notice you write better music. Another way to learn a lot, which has helped me in the past so much, is writing mockups. And with mockups, I mean things like this, like take another composer's track, rewrite it entirely by ear as it is, or try to write it as it is, and then add other things on top of it, like I do. In this case, I just rewrote the track as it was, but my way of doing it, things is like taking a track, analyzing it, rewriting it by ear, and then adding lots of stuff to it. So I did that for my remix of The Landing. I did that, did that with my Cuphead remix, which is like the original track is like a swing track. And I made it like a Western orchestral track. So, you know, the idea behind it, though, is always analyzing other composers' work. Because when you do that, it really leads you to discover lots of things about orchestrating and arranging. And that knowledge is what makes a great composer. So that's pretty much why I said in the beginning of this video that piracy can be a mistake. It can backlash on you because it 
imposes upon you the mentality of, oh yeah, I have so many libraries, I'm just going to go through all the presets and find the one that's right for me. Instead of, you know, focusing on your skills to the point that you can make each preset right for you, you know? So, you know, I'm not only talking from a moral standpoint. I'm not, I'm not here to, like, impose morals upon you about, about piracy and whatnot. But from a logical standpoint, it hurts you. And it hurts, you know, the sample library developers as well, but it hurts the growth of your music the most. So it makes more sense to only buy libraries and to buy a few and really invest your you know, time into making those libraries sound good, sound good because it saves you money first and it makes you better as a composer second, which are two huge bonuses, right? So if you want to learn more about how to make your libraries shine, there are lots of tutorials on this channel, which I published throughout the course of this year that can help you a lot if you haven't checked them out. And um, if you have checked them out, I'm sure there are many you must have missed. You might have missed. So go back and check out the tutorials on this channel. And also, if you want to analyze my tracks, like you want to get access to the multi-tracks and the, the midis to import them in your DW and see how they are done, you can get those files on my Patreon page and the link is in the description of this video. And in there, I upload the stamps and the multi-tracks and the midi of all the tracks I publish on YouTube. So you go there, if you make a pledge, you are going to help me make this channel, you know, sustainable to run and you're going to get rewards back. And uh, yeah, that's it for this video. If you have questions, feel free to ask them in the comments because I know this is such a controversial topic. You might have questions and do share this video with a friend who might need to be disillusioned by this whole gear and libraries thing. Because I see lots of people with insane gear and insane libraries and who are also unable to use those. So that's not very good. It's like having a Ferrari park in, you, in your garage because you don't know how to use it, you know? It's useless like that. So do encourage your friends to work on their skills and not on getting new libraries, all right? So that's it for this video. I'll see you in the next one next week. Bye.